while the participants are still entering, we are going to start this webinar now. So I would like to welcome you in the name of Medical Care Service for Refugees Bochum, a social medical human rights organization and psychosocial treatment center for survivors of torture and war. My name is Bianca Schmolze, and I'm responsible for human rights advocacy projects in our organization, focusing on refugees' rights and the rights of survivors of crimes against humanity to truth, justice, and integral reparation. With our work on justice heals, we promote the international fight against impunity and lobby for the rights of refugees guaranteed in the UN Convention relating on the status of refugees. We are very happy that we found two excellent cooperation partners in Medico International and the Institute for the International Law of Peace and Armed Conflict to realize this digital series of lectures on the occasion of the 17th anniversary, 17th <laughs> anniversary of the Refugees Convention. I would also like to thank the, thank the Foundation for Environment and Development, North Rhine-Westphalia and Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for funding this project. Before we start, let me introduce you my colleague, Sissi Cazzioni, a PhD student of the Institute. She will present. Thank you very much, Bianca, for the introduction. Good afternoon to everyone from me as well. It surely is a great pleasure to be co-hosting this lecture on behalf of the Institute for International Law of Peace and Armed Conflict. During the first session of this lecture series, we had the opportunity to explore the drafting process of the Refugee Convention and to discuss a bit about the refugees' uh, non-inclusion during the treaty's drafting process, as well as during the decision-making processes of today. But in this second lecture, we're going to dive into more detail and we're going to discuss a little bit more about the functions of the international refugee law, as well as about its protection gaps. Whereas, I'm, I'm loud, huh? Yes, okay, I'm on, sorry. <laughs> Whereas the Universal Human Rights Declaration of the UN states that every human being has the right to seek asylum, the UN Refugees Convention, or correctly, the Geneva Convention relating to the status of refugees, is the key treaty that fixes the individual right to have access to an effective asylum procedure. Today, both instruments are more and more questioned and violated by governments who try to prevent refugees from entering their territories by any means, like inhuman refugee camps at the external borders, illegal pushbacks with de facto impunity and policies that systematically violate basic rights of refugees. With this series of lectures, we want to highlight the importance of the Geneva Convention. And in this second session, we will learn about the Refugees Convention, its content, its development, its limits and challenges, and how it was implemented by member states. Again, we are delighted to discuss with two international experts that we would like to present shortly to you. Dr. Nicholas Fistan, a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. Nick has taught master's level courses on international refugee law at Aalborg University and Aarhus University. And he is also chair of the working group on externalization of the refugee law initiative. His academic work has been published in several prestigious academic journals, and he has also acted as legal consultant for Amnesty International, the Danish Refugee Council, and the UNHCR on various aspects of international protection. And we also have Ms. J. Mary Ruhundwa, who is a co-founder and currently the executive director at Dignity Kwanzaa. She has over 13 years of experience in diverse areas, including refugee rights, nationality rights, migration and development, and NGO management. Before founding Dignity Kwanzaa, she served as the country director of Asylum Access Tanzania, assistant protection officer at UNHCR Tanzania, and assistant lecturer at Tumaini University. She is currently the co-founder and the chair of the Tanzania Refugee and Migration Network and a member of the National Anti-Trafficking Committee. Welcome both, and it's a great pleasure to have you in our event. Now, before we start, uh, I would like to quickly remind everyone that a Q&A session will follow 
after the presentations of uh, our lecture. So please feel free to type in any questions that you may have in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and we will address them to the lecturers in due time. Uh, for privacy reasons, and given this webinar is being recorded, we will not announce your name. While we read the questions, we will just uh, read the questions out and address them to the lecturers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sissy. Now we can proceed with the substantive part of our webinar. To this end, I would like to hand over to you, Nick, to explain the Refugees Convention and its role in the global protection of refugees. Thank you very much, Bianca and Sissy. I'll just try and share my screen. I hope that's visible to everybody here. Um, Wonderful to be with you and uh, congratulations on this important and timely seminar series as both the Refugee Convention, of course, and UNHCR, the Refugee Agency, turn 70. So in my 30-minute uh, intervention today, I'm going to address four historical legal elements of the convention that, of course, speak to us today. Um, they are firstly and briefly the drafting of the convention itself between 1949 and 1951, the main legal implications of the convention as I see them, the protection gaps left by the convention, and finally some legal developments since 1951, particularly the 1967 protocol, the African Refugee Convention and the Katahina Declaration. I should say, of course, at the outset that um, it's a difficult task to try and sum up both the historical legal importance of the convention and UNHCR in 30 minutes. So I hope you'll accept that I'm making a, a rather pedagogical and limited approach to these very, very big questions. But to move firstly then to <clears throat> the drafting of the Refugee Convention, between uh, 1948 and 51, the convention slowly took shape through a combination of United Nations organs, a specialist ad hoc committee, and finally a conference of plenipotentiaries. And this followed, of course, the study of comparative national laws and international agreements conducted by the United Nations Secretary General in 1949. Um, so what we saw was the emergence of different bodies uh, taking up the text of the draft convention and discussing its terms. Firstly, an ad hoc committee. Secondly, the, uh, this, uh, the tabling of a draft at ECOSOC. And finally, a report to the United Nations General Assembly with final consultations ending at the Conference of Plenipotentiaries in July 1951. If one could make some uh, sort of political remarks at this point, in very general terms, of course, we could say that <clears throat> the Soviet bloc at the time were rather keen to exclude political émigré uh, from the refugee definition that may expose them to political criticism. On the other hand, the Western bloc were rather concerned with uh, guarantees for socioeconomic human rights. And of course, it was quite obvious that in the wake of the Second World War, the convention was essentially drafted to help redistribute refugees in Europe away from the continent. So there was a sense in Europe that um, they had been dealing with the bulk of displacement since the war and an argument that um, other UN member states should help in resettling and indeed integrating war refugees, including those uh, coming by influx from the Eastern Bloc. So one can say fairly clearly, I think that in its origins, the convention was Eurocentric in outlook. Of course, there were rather significant both geographical and temporal limitations to the convention. Uh, initially, the convention was designed to cover only events prior to 1951, and of course, were, was limited to events within Europe. So in essence, one can say that the convention did not cover support or protection for non-European refugees, and there was thus no obligation for European states to take in countries refugees outside of the European region. This, of course, was later changed by the 1967 protocol. When we think of the purpose of the convention, 
we look, of course, at the preamble, which, which uh, refers to both the United Nations Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, um, and, and states that the convention endeavors to assure refugees the widest possible exercise of fundamental rights and freedoms. And this is, of course, highly relevant to European restrictionist policies today. As to um, this, the particular states involved in these various uh, drafting measures, without going into detail, I think what is notable is that there were eight states who were in fact present at each negotiation table between 1949 and 51. These were Belgium, Brazil, Canada, Denmark, France, the UK, the US, and Venezuela as an observer to ECOSELC. So some scholars have pointed out that by their pure presence to negotiations, these eight states had particular opportunities to influence the process and outcome of the convention than others. To turn then to the legal implications of the convention, I've chosen four main legal aspects to focus on. And as I mentioned at the outset, these are by no means an exhaustive list. Um, what I'd like to go through now briefly is, of course, the definition question, the non more principle, integrative rights in the convention, and of course, the creation of UNHCR. So to turn first to the definitional question, um, as you'll see here, uh, and, and as many of you would know, uh, Article 1A2 of the Refugee Convention sets out the key criteria for protection under the 1951 Convention. And a few general observations can be made at the outset. The first, of course, is that the Geneva, that the Refugee Convention requires that the refugee must personally be at risk of persecution in an individualized sense. And this, of course, has drawn into question whether war refugees fall under the scope of the convention itself, where one must show an individualized reason for flight. The concept behind this, of course, is that war tends to create situations of indiscriminate violence, which could be seen to be somehow opposite to the individualized fear of persecution that the convention seems to require. And indeed, it's worth noting um, that this highly personal approach was a departure from uh, pre-1951 instruments, which tended to have a clear group focus rather than a personal focus. And of course, uh, a key component of the refugee definition is that of alienage, which is to say that the person must be outside their country of origin to be protected by the convention. Thus, the Refugee Convention does not recognize internally displaced persons or indeed any barriers that may prevent people from exiting their country of origin. And again, this was discussed in the drafting process. There were in fact some draft definitions that considered refugees as internally displaced persons, um, um, but that uh, more inclusive definition was rejected on the basis that there was a need to cross an international border. If one looks further at the convention definition, there is of course the requirement of a well-founded fear, both on subjective and objective grounds. And of course, this key term persecution, um, which sets, I think, a fairly high bar in terms of the harm that must be feared by the individual concerned. Um, of course, scholars have debated, as well as courts and governments, the meaning of persecution. And I think today we have a definition around sustained or, sustained or systematic violation of basic human rights, either by the state or as the result of a failure of state protection. Um, on the other hand, of course, it is also quite clear that most governments do not consi consider, for example, denial of food or right to labour as constituting persecution. So here we see a focus on civil and political rights rather than socioeconomic rights in the convention. As to the absolute cornerstone of international refugee law, of course, Article 33.1 of the Convention lays down the principle of non more. This has been called the cornerstone by Guy Godwin Gill, the essence of the Convention by Lauterpacht and Bethlehem, and indeed is considered the absolutely most important offering about uh, within the Convention regime. Of course, all asylum seekers are protected by the principle bolstered by human rights law 
and it's now generally understood to apply extraterritorially, that is to say, on the high seas or in, in border regions. Um, I'm sure in our discussion we'll return to the, the, um, the scope and uh, ability of not local law to, to protect asylum seekers in need. Perhaps an, uh, an overlooked area of the convention is, of course, the rather long catalogue of socioeconomic rights that attach to refugees after they have been declared as in need of international protection. And rather than a universal set of rights that immediately kick into play um, once a person has been granted asylum, this rather resembles a patchwork where the rights that a refugee can claim and the exact content of these rights depend on the attachment of the refugee to the asylum state and indeed the treatment of the asylum state uh, with respect to both its own nationals and other aliens generally. So what we see here is a convention regime which is rather legally complex, which is to say that the, the closer and the more attached a person is to the asylum state, the more rights accrue to that person. Um, there are a set of rights that do accrue as soon as a person with it is within the state's jurisdiction, for example, the principle of non for But indeed, as a person um, remains on the territory and gains legal status, they will indeed gain more and more rights. And then, of course, we have Article 34, which is a rather weak call for states to consider the naturalisation of refugees, but indeed not a requirement that refugees be granted permanent residency, citizenship or naturalisation. As I mentioned on the top uh, axis here, you'll see the standards of treatment that are afforded to refugees. Um, these, as I've said, are based uh, with reference to the rights accorded either citizens of the asylum state or indeed other aliens within the country. And these vary from absolute rights to indeed uh, most favoured nationals or citizens. So one can see already that the, the, the right structure under the convention is rather legally complex and not particularly well suited to the universal terms of human rights um, that other uh, human rights legal systems uh, use. Finally, of course, a really significant um, legal implication of the convention is, of course, the creation and coupling of UNHCR and its statute with the 1951 Convention. And of course, we see in Article 35 of the Convention, the duty of uh, states parties to cooperate with the UN Refugee Agency. Now, as I've said, frankly, it's impossible to sum up the vast legal, diplomatic and operational role that UNHCR played both historically and today. So what I've done instead is I, I've drawn a few historical notes from the work of Jeff Crisp, who's been writing recently on the development of the agency. In 1950, of course, UNHCR was created by United Nations General Assembly uh, re resolution, that is to say, before the convention was created. And the agency was created with a fixed term of three years, primarily to deal with the unresolved refugee problems associated with the Second World War. By the end of its first operational year, according to CRISP, the organization had a budget of around $300,000 and employed 33 staff, all based in Geneva. At the time, around 100,000 refugees were under the agency's mandate, most of whom had been living in camps in Europe since the end of the Second World War. Indeed, in its early days, the primary purpose of UNHCR was to find long-term solutions for these camp residents and other refugees, and indeed to encourage states to sign up to the convention framework. So this rather narrow framework and temporary uh, origins have, of course, morphed into a particularly broad mandate and a rather more permanent existence. So as we see throughout the 50s, of course, in 56, UNHCR was engaged to deal with the Hungarian uprising and Soviet invasion of that country. Uh, in 57, UNHCR established presence in North Africa, in, in Morocco and Tunisia in particular, following the Algerian War of Independence. In the 60s, of course, liberation struggles in sub-Saharan Africa brought the agency into that region. And of course, in the 70s and 80s, we saw UNHCR extend its activities through the dictatorships of Latin American 
countries and displacement flows flowing from that. Equally in the 1970s and 80s, the fallout from the Vietnam War and um, the comprehensive plan of action throughout the Indochinese region and indeed Southeast Asia brought the agency into play in that part of the world. So what we see of course is that um, UNHCR has a key uh, supervision role vis-a-vis -vis the convention, but also a very strong operational role uh, in the protection of refugees. And of fundamental importance here, UNHCR is equally present, indeed often more present in states that are not party to the convention. Uh, such as Pakistan and India. Today, according to CRISP, UNHCR's annual budget is over $8.6 billion, with the number of refugees and other persons of concern uh, standing at around 78 million. Uh, of these, the agency is only legally uh, only responsible for around 20 million refugees, with the vast majority of displaced populations making up IDPs. UNHCR employs 18,000 people across 135 countries in each part of the world. And while its headquarters remain in Geneva, 90% of its foot workforce is indeed in the field. Not engaged in the rather limited mandate of protection and solutions, but rather the provision of food, shelter, water, sanitation, healthcare, social services, and security. So to move then in our limited time to address some of the protection gaps left open by the convention. Again, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but I wanted to highlight three particular legal loopholes we have here. Um, that is of course, responsibility sharing, access to asylum and a lack of supervision. So as to responsibility sharing, as many of you would know, the, the body of the convention, the, the key terms of the convention are in fact silent on how states should cooperate internationally to share the responsibility for refugees. While the preamble of the convention acknowledges the international nature of the refugee issue, um, and, and indeed uh, UNHCR has constant, consistently called for international cooperation that both enhances refugee protection and durable solutions, um, there have, there, there, there have been no international global instruments that indeed codify and create legal obligations around responsibility sharing. There have, of course, been attempts along these lines, uh, often led by UNHCR. So already in 1970, we saw a process around um, a treaty on territorial asylum, trying to codify the principle of territorial asylum. This ended rather disastrously, disastrously in a soft law declaration due to lack of support for the principle. In the 90s and early 2000s, UNHCR led a so-called Convention Plus initiative, um, which has since subsided. And of course, the current iteration of a push for a global responsibility sharing regime is the Global Compact on Refugees, not a legally binding agreement, but rather a non-binding uh, agreement passed by the United Nations General Assembly in 2018. The purpose of the Global Compact is the equitable sharing of burden and responsibility for hosting and supporting the world's refugees. And indeed, time will tell whether it can deliver on that particular promise and objective. The second key gap, and, and of course, highly related to responsibility sharing is, is a lack of access to asylum. So as uh, human rights uh, students and scholars among us would know, um, asylum is indeed a human right afforded to anyone who is a refugee within the meaning of the 1951 Convention. And while, of course, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights include, includes a right to seek asylum, um, the Refugee Convention is indeed entirely silent on the access issue. Of course, to access the Convention's protection, a refugee must reach a place of refuge, a right of access that is not guaranteed in human rights or refugee law. And as I've discussed earlier, rather than a positive duty to seek asylum, the Refugee Convention indeed includes rather a negative duty of non refoulement This means that as a matter of international law, states have so far been unwilling at the global level, in, at least, to grant asylum to persons who are seeking protection on their territory um, as a matter of systematic course. 
However, the non different law principle, of course, means that states are not entirely free to do what they wish with asylum seekers. Indeed, it requires that they adopt a course that does not result in the removal directly or indirectly of a person to a place where their life or freedom would be in danger in account, on account of their race, religion, nationality, or membership of a particular social group or political opinion. And as many of you would know, states are indeed experimenting with how far they can push the non conformal principle. And this normative gap between the right to seek asylum on the one hand and the principle of non conformal on the other. And we, of course, see this reflected, this experimentation reflected in current uh, so called externalization processes. So, of course, current approaches in both Australia and the US with the interception of asylum seekers and transfer to third countries and indeed current proposals in both Denmark and the United Kingdom of similar responsibility shifting ideas. A further gap I'd like to address is what I'm calling a lack of supervision over the convention. Um, and of course, it's important to note that UNHCR does have a supervisory role, but it has one that is highly politicized and operationalized, unlike the uh, treaty bodies of other UN treaties. So as far as I'm aware, the 951 Convention essentially stands alone as the only human rights treaty without a expert monitoring body attached to it. And then of course, one could consider whether the work of UNHCR in providing guidance is sufficient or whether there indeed is need for an expert body to interpret the core uh, principles contained within the Refugee Convention. So among scholarship, there's significant uh, recent uh, ideas around, around remedying this gap. Um, uh, for example, uh, Achilles Skjordas has called for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice to settle some of these disputes around the content of the core norms, such as access to asylum, non conformal et cetera, et cetera. Jean-Francois Durio equally has um, considered further uh, additional protocol possibilities, um, perhaps, for example, with respect to refugee children or indeed in mass influx situations to allow states to derogate from some of their convention obligations. Equally, uh, the leading scholar B.S. Chimney has recently called for a so-called refugee rights committee that is to say, a body of independent experts along the lines of other UN human rights treaty bodies, such as the Human Rights Committee or the Committee Against Torture. So to move then from um, normative legal implications and legal gaps, I want to speak briefly to some developments since 1951. And the first, of course, in the legal arena is the 1967 Protocol. Um, which of course achieves what might be called formal universalization of the convention. So it removed the temporal and geographical limitations. Uh, the convention and its protocol no longer applies to events uh, before 1951, but indeed to refugees uh, throughout uh, contemporary time. And indeed, um, of course, not just European refugees, but more globally, any refugee. Uh, from any state in the world. And it's worth noting here, of course, that a few countries have signed the 951 protocol, uh, sorry, the 951 convention, but not the 1967 protocol or vice versa. So the United States, for example, has only signed the protocol. Turkey, very notably, the, the largest host of refugees globally, has signed both the convention and the protocol, but indeed retains the geographical limitation. That is to say that Turkey only recognizes uh, convention refugees as originating from Europe. So while formal universalization, universalization was achieved through the 1967 protocol, one could argue that, that we're still lacking what might be called substantive universalization. That is to say, the definition did not change. The definition remains focused on an individual risk of, of flight based on civil and political rights, notably not natural disasters, economic crisis, or indeed general conflict. Um, two years later, of course, we saw the um, signing of the OAU Convention, a regional 
Refugee Convention related specifically to the African refugee situation. And the key question, of course, is, well, how did this uh, develop the scope of the convention definition of 1951? And what we see from the definition set down in Article 1.2 of the OAU Convention is a recognition that um, people may flee not just government persecution, but also situations where governments lose authority due to external aggression, occupation, or foreign domination. So an acknowledgement of not just uh, legal structures, but indeed de facto uh, power situations. One can also say that this um, definition reflects a group approach that's more akin to the pre-1951 refugee instruments and refers, refers rather broadly to situations of war and disturbances to public order. So a recognition that refugeehood occurs not just as a result of a general danger, but, oh sorry, can, can occur as a result of a general danger rather than merely an individual fear. There's also no nexus requirement, that is to say a refugee under the OAU convention need not prove a link to their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership of a political social group. Um, and finally, of course, it's worth noting that the OAU Convention definition um, uh, acknowledges that uh, refugees may flee uh, violence or disturbances from just one part of their country. That is to say, there's no requirement that the entire country be engulfed in conflict. Um, of course, then we have the 1984 Cartagena de Declaration, which is uh, not a, a regional treaty, but rather a Latin American piece of soft law that has been highly influential, um, not so much in creating its own regional system, but rather in um, flowing down to the national um, uh, legislations of Latin American states. And of course, uh, the Cartagena Declaration was a response to the inability of the 1951 convention to cover much of the forced displacement from generalized violence and oppression in Central America. So again, the Cartagena Declaration acknowledges that flight may occur as a result of not just government actions, but indeed external powers. And it offers, offers a rather qualified acceptance of the notion of group determination. So while all applicants must show that their lives safety or freedom have been threatened, there is this concept of general violence um, as a very broad category uh, that refugees may fall under, under the Cartagena Declaration. Um, and it's worth noting that while Cartagena is very much uh, celebrated in the refugee law world, uh, not each and every state in the region has taken up the, the definition as laid out in the declaration. Finally, of course, um, we have the EU's own qualification directive first instituted in 2004, which of course creates a sort of additional form of what's called subsidiary protection for those who fall outside the refugee convention that cannot be returned due to EU member states' non-government obligations under human rights law, which is indeed more expansive than the 1951 convention. So here, where a person does not qualify as a refugee, but indeed nonetheless faces a real risk of suffering serious harm, um, they will receive subsidiary protection status. Now, serious harm in EU law refers to the death penalty, uh, torture or inhuman degrading treatment or punishment in the country of origin, or indeed in the, in the context of conflict, a serious and individual threat to a civilian's life because of indiscriminate violence in situations of armed conflict. So we see a sort of gradual uh, building up, the scaffolding of the 951 definition uh, in at least a few regions globally. If I could sum up then, um, given my time is running short, by way of some conclusions on the 1951 convention and its history, we've seen, of course, the emergence of uh, a European to at least formally universal instrument. So this initially Europe-centric treaty is now truly global 
149 UN member states are currently party of the 1951 Convention. 44 UN member states are not. But it's worth noting, of course, that the lack of uptake is, a, is disproportionately in regions where refugees tend to reside. So there are some key, key states that are hosting many hundreds of thousands of refugees who are not party to the Refugee Convention. We've discussed, of course, the definition question, um, and I would say that it has proved somewhat elastic, both within the convention framework and indeed in these uh, legal developments at the regional level. But of course, the definition of refugee remains individualized and generally remains focused on civil political rights rather than socioeconomic harms. It has, of course, been updated by the OAU Convention and Cartagena and the EU uh, asylum regime. But nonetheless, there remain or there persist questions of, for example, the status of war refugees. And while we've seen recent achievements, I think, in extending the Refugee Convention definition to women, to LGBT asylum seekers, there are, of course, newer outstanding questions relating to climate migration. With respect to responsibility sharing, in my view, the lack of a responsibility sharing framework remains the absolute thorn in the side of the international refugee regime. Of course, the convention is silent on access to asylum. And the key question here is whether the global compact framework or indeed another initiative can act to fill this gap. So in sum, we've seen significant legal development since 1951, but still a lack of legal coverage in key regions notably the Middle East and the Asia Pacific. And finally, in my view, the lack of a legally authoritative supervisory body makes the implementation of the Refugee Convention a constant question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick, for this insightful presentation. We're going to come back to this um, later, so feel free to type in any questions you may have in the Q&A section and we will address them to Nick later. Uh, now, uh, dear Jane Marie, I think we should turn to you. Um, would you like to tell us a bit about the limits of the Refugee Convention and how it is perceived in other uh, regions? We have heard about this Eurocentric um, approach in the beginning of Nick's uh, presentation. So uh, would you like to, I would like to give you the floor now and hear more about the limitations of the existing law from you. Thank you. Thank you, Sisi. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to talk about um, uh, UDC Kwanzaa and why I'm here. I, I know I'm not, um, uh, not in a research institution for higher learning institution um, from the NGO. Uh, so Dignity Kwanzaa is a national organization registered and uh, working in Tanzania to safeguard and promote human dignity of refugees, vulnerable migrants, and other vulnerable populations. So sorry, Jane, mean, sorry, Jane Mary. Yes. Can you can you talk a little more into the microphone because I, we can hear you very, very silently. Oh, sorry. Thank you. How is this? How does better, it much better. Okay. Thank you. So, okay, so I was uh, telling you about Dignity Kwanzaa that it's an organization registered and working in Tanzania. And its uh, mission is to promote human dignity of refugees, uh, vulnerable migrants, and other vulnerable populations uh, for the attainment of the economic and social development. Uh, through legal aid, provision, community empowerment, and advocacy, Dignity Kwanzaa seeks to contribute to the effort to develop refu a refugee regime that effectively responds to the needs and concerns of refugees and host governments and also the host community. Dignity Kwanzaa happens to be the only national organization that engages uh, in advocacy for uh, refugee legal and policy reforms that will give refugees access to opportunities and tools to rebuild their lives and attain their full potential and contribute to finding lasting solutions. 
So I had prepared my presentation. Um, so what I'm um, mentioning, but uh, most of them have already been shared by uh, Dr. Khan. Um, Can we excuse me? I wanted to highlight this. Yes, excuse me. The, yes. the audience cannot hear you very, very well. So uh, please take the mic as near as possible to your mouth okay. because it would be a pity. Oh, much I, better. Yeah, much, much yeah better. I also apologize. My voice is not, um, I, I think I, was, I stayed out in the cold for, for a long time in the few days. So my voice is not uh, the way it is. So I'll try to do this if it works. Does this work? Hello? Yes, it works perfectly. Better, much better. I think now the internet okay, connection. Thank you. Ah, you're back. Okay. So I have prepared to speak about um, of the, the down because it has done this before <laughs> and I've tried um, a different approach today, hoping it will not disappoint me. So uh, I first wanted to uh, make a few points um, uh, about um, the limitations, but my focus was more on um, the, the, the practice, the, the limitations and how they are felt uh, on the ground. So most of the limitations are the same that uh, have already been mentioned. Uh, by the previous speaker. Um, uh, they are in two folds. Uh, there are those that are due to gaps that are inherent in the convention itself. By convention, I mean the 1951 Refugee Convention, but also there are limitations that are due to external factors that are outside the, 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 the convention. So in terms of limitations that are inherent to, to the to the uh, convention, I'll probably not want to go back uh, to what uh, the previous speaker mentioned because they are the same same that I have mentioned. But I wanted to go to the limitations that are outside the convention. And these are basically, um, these are basically the fact, this is the fact that uh, the observance uh, uh, or the adherence of uh, the, the, the convention, just like any other international instrument is more dependent on willingness uh, or political will of the implementing state. And uh, at this point, it's worth noting that there is pretty much little that can be done to, uh, to, to, to push states into, into adhering to the international law. So this is one of the major uh, 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 issue that I thought it's worth mentioning, other than the other limitations that you were mentioned. Of course, the issue of um, lack of uh, uh, lack of uh, clear mentioning of the uh, uh, burden sharing is also um, one of the serious limitations that we are facing on the ground when approaching uh, authorities uh, regarding refugee uh, uh, respect. Uh, to refugee law or, pro, uh, or, or um, providing more access to uh, access to more uh, rights to refugees. And um, one example that is often given is uh, the fact that there is a feeling that the burden sharing is not enough. But other than that, uh, the feeling that the contribution of host states, especially in the global south, is not taken into consideration. And uh, I, one of the examples that has been given constantly is, at, at least where I work, is um, that if, uh, if the land uh, on which refugee camps are set is um, leased to either UNHCR or to refugees, or the, the, the firewood that um, is used by refugees on daily basis is, is sold to them, how much would that be in terms of cash? And if this is not quantified, uh, it is assumed that the contribution of the, of the 
uh, host community, especially in the global south, when many refugees are, is not appreciated. So this is one of the 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 uh, the gap that um, started from the the global. I mean, the convention itself that manifests itself in 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 practice, and um, it blocks a lot of uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, advances made towards uh, advocating for refugee rights, advocating for adherence of the at least the minimum standards that are set in the refugee convention. So that is one example. I'm sorry, I'm just jumping up and down because the way I had set my presentation is a, a bit different from how I have uh, decided to present it. So um, that is one. Uh, but also, uh, yeah, contemporary. There's a lot of contemporary issues being brought up as 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 um, reasons as to why uh, uh, com the convention is not uh, adhered as it's supposed to be adhered to. Um, there's also the issue of that would probably go back to the limit uh, to the to the definition as it was explained before the issue of economic refugees versus genuine refugees we're we're meeting that a lot uh on the ground when we we we, we talk about um whether repatriations uh the repatriations are are really uh voluntary or not uh the issue of whether uh these refugees who uh came uh, in groups and we are given a uh, group recognition whether all of them are still uh, uh, still meet the refugee the refugee definition and um, uh, this is hard to to explain and um, since the law is a bit uh, the convention itself is a bit strict on uh, who on the proof of, of persecution and all that Sometimes it's 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 hard to make reference to the law in those kinds of of discussions and arguments, because regardless of our our, our questions to to the voluntariness of repatriation, it still feels like if we decide to go the convention way in determining uh, determining uh, status of these people on individual basis, they will probably most of them will probably not fit uh, the refugee definition. Luckily. Luckily, the the the, the 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 country here has has ratified the OAU convention, the 1961 convention, but also has um, uh, has included the the extended definition that is in the OAU convention within its domestic law. So that's that's uh, that's one of the, the uh, uh, good things that at least are in place. But in terms of, of, of um, in terms of uh, observance of the law in practice, um, I wanted also to mention a few issues. Um, uh, I just mentioned the fact that uh, uh, such observance is always not is in, is often not uh, informed by uh, by uh, the commitment to the legal obligations uh, that comes. Uh, from the signing and ratify ratification of the of the of the convention, but rather it's 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 uh, it just comes from the, the 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 political will of of the state. And a few examples that I have is um, from here. Uh, so Tanzania uh, has signed uh, the uh, the 1951 Refugee Convention. It's it's 1967. Uh, protocol, uh, the, OA, the 1969 convention, and again it has enacted a, a domestic law, uh, the 1998 Refugee Act. Uh, but even before before enacting this act, it was uh, sort of legally bound to these uh, uh, global uh, refugee law instruments that it has ratified. But without changing any of its commitment under the global refugee law, Tanzania has maintained two has has, has gone through two different uh, refugee policies. Uh, one commonly known as the open door policy, uh, which is a um, progressive policy, and it was in practice before the 1990s. Under this policy, uh, you might know already that uh, the then president, uh, the first president of of Tanzania, received an Nansen Award for an outstanding protection um, uh, given to refugees then. 
but without changing anything in terms of its commitment or legal, uh, legal obligations, uh, it moved towards the um, uh, what is known as a closed uh, door policy, but it's basically a restrictive policy. And this was from uh, 1990s. Under this policy, uh, Tanzania, as uh, the international community, has sometimes criticized it for inconsistencies in meeting its obligations under the refugee law. So this clearly tells you that it really doesn't matter whether a state is part to uh, mostly uh, giving the example of Tanzania and some other countries, nearby countries. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether a country has ratified uh, um, the, the refugee um, convention or not. Uh, the, 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 uh, the practice on the ground is totally informed by other factors, not necessarily legal factors. Another example is um, uh, a situation, uh, mostly in Africa again, uh, during the independence struggles, uh, due to the to the definition of refugees that is in the in the is in the 1951 convention, uh, some freedom fighters who were in exile were not considered to be refugees, and uh, states that decided to host them were not receiving assistance from UNHCR, for example. But despite the fact that most States like Tanzania then were uh, really struggling economically, trying, had just gotten it, their independence themselves, struggling to build the economy, but they really, really provided um, uh, uh, asylum to these freedom fighters uh, without support from, from, without support from UNHCR and other international community members. So this tells you that it's just something Thing that they wanted to do, whether the law allows them to do so, whether there is support to do so or not. So uh, 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 I'm try just trying to insist the fact that um, in practice, the signing or not signing of the law um, uh, of, the, of the convention doesn't really uh, have a, 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 a serious impact. Of course it does. Uh, the previous speaker has mentioned uh, many nations that have not signed the refugee um, convention but still offers uh, asylum to asylum to refugees and um, um, some of them are meeting uh, 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 are providing even more than what is provided in the in the as minimum standards in the in the refugee convention um, so um, uh, so what is what what um, what should be done in this situation um, uh, if if states it's it's always it's always okay if the state does better than what is provided in the in the in the convention, but when they depart from uh, uh, um, in terms of protection when they don't meet the minimum standards it's always an issue. So here comes the the, the question of um, what is the role of judiciary in this situation when uh, states have have. Um, signed and ratified conventions, uh, but they are not meeting it. So uh, it's clearly known that the, the judiciary has a major role in interpretation uh, of the law, but also in remedying, in providing remedies where there are rights violations. But in practice, from our experience here, it is shown, uh, we, have, we, it's, 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 um, we have observed that um, many practitioners in the global south rarely uses, uh, rarely use courts uh, to try to compel states to meet their obligations under the global refugee law. Uh, they, they tend to, um, to uh, be inclined more uh, to using uh, soft advocacy instead. And this, um, this also would, uh, would tell um, a number of things. One of them is the, um, is the, 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 the belief um, uh, that um, or the view that refugee pro protection is a humanitarian and a moral act, and is not looked at as, as a legal obligation uh, for states to provide asylum, for states to provide protection to refugees. So it is seen as if if you're taking a state to court to compel it, uh, it's, it's, it's like biting the, 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 the hand that is feeding you, that they it's assumed that the gov governments are uh, 
already doing, uh, 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 have already gone out of their way to provide asylum. And when you challenge them on the, on the standards of protection they're providing and you challenge the, them in court, uh, uh, it's, it's not looked at uh, positively. But again, um, it also says it also says something about the whole um, the whole uh, system in place because we see this often in in, in the global south. So um, and this is not a peculiar an issue that is peculiar to to uh, refugee issues only. Uh, it's 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 there are situations where um, you might go to court and uh, the the court would give orders that will not be um, uh, adhered to, and uh, there's also always a fear that the the government, especially in cases of refugees, would retaliate by uh, maybe um, expelling refugees. Uh, of course, it's not allowed under the law, but it's something that the government can do, and um, its refugees would would suffer uh, uh, when that happens. So, in most cases, um, uh, in uh, Practitioners prefer to go for soft um, advocacy, trying to negotiate and uh, um, uh, find better ways to to uh, uh, to make governments uh, um, observe the law. Uh, again, it goes to uh, the question of the role of legal aid providers in these circumstances. Uh, for for for. Uh, the importance of legal aid providers is, is well known, um, especially in the in the uh, in the RSD refugee status determination processes. Many refugees, especially those who go through uh, individual refugee status determination, would probably not uh, succeed in their application, the asylum application, if they did not receive legal aid. But again, we are seeing this. Um, uh, at least where we're practicing, we're seeing that it's, it's um, legal aid, our legal representation in, in refugee status uh, uh, determination processes is not, um, is not uh, uh, supported or promoted. Uh, and also legal present representation is, is, is so welcome when, when, when um, uh, there is a matter between a, a, a individual refugees or a refugee and another individual. But when it's a refugee having a claim against the state, you would see that um, legal aid providers would hesitate to 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 take part in that kind of in that kind of a, of a case. And uh, even when they decide to intervene, that is not taken uh, so positively. So. Um, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, I can say there's a lot to be done to bridge the gap between uh, the letter of the law and the practice uh, uh, at national levels, uh, because um, the law is there uh, so that it's followed. But when it is not followed, uh, it poses challenges. And the, 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 the the aim of protecting or ensuring effective protection to refugees will not be met. So, in terms of um, in terms of uh, 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 as 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 a conclusion, I am seeing that probably I'm, I'm running out of time. So, as a conclusion, uh, in order to strengthen the power of of refugee law, it is important to first uh, build trust among the actors, both state and non-state actors, because uh, uh, given the history of the, given the history of the, the uh, 1951 convention, for example, and the gaps that were explained before, there are times where it, feel, it feels like um, uh, the provisions of the law are meant for certain states. Um, and clearly, that would be the, the, the states where many refugees are, and this is in the global south. And especially, and this when it's um, when it's coupled with uh, it's coupled with hesitancy uh, of some countries in the global north to also meet their obligations when they have, uh, uh, for example, asylum seekers on their uh, on, at their doors. It really brings um, it really brings questions 
So it is very important to build trust among actors, uh, but also it is important to find ways of making sure that there is true and meaningful burden sharing, and that is also felt by host states members, uh, 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 because uh, but it also should start with recognizing their role as I mean their 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 their, their, their 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 um, uh, contribution as host states, and probably something like quantifying the non-monetary um, the non-monetary contribution, but also having a clear a clear basis on how uh, burden sharing should be. It doesn't have to be monetary only. Uh, uh, again, um, it's important to adopt a human rights approach to refugee protection, not just a uh, humanitarian and developmental approach. Um, it's also uh, important to enhance the enforcement, enforcement uh, mechanism of the, the, the uh, uh, refugee convention. So in short, it's important to, um, to, seriously, uh, uh, to seriously and truly implement the global compact on refugees, because most of these suggestions that I have, have given are already uh, have already been put in the in the global compact on refugees uh, of course in the CRA. So let me end there and um, uh, I can respond to quest to specific questions. And again, apologies that I've been uh, I lost the flow because uh, the, the way I prepared my presentation is, is different from how I had to present it. Thank no, you. Thank, thank you so much, Jane Marie, for your perspective and your work, clear words for the situation also in the global south and in Tanzania. So important to hear that and to know about that. So a uh, first question I would like to ask uh, you both. So as we heard, the political will lies in the focus of refugee protection. And as we can see worldwide, this political will is not there. So. Um, Please, uh, Nick, when you could you please uh, explain a little more what was the idea of the UNHCR to find durable solutions together with government for uh, refugee protection and why does it not work? <laughs> Thanks very much, January, for a great uh, presentation. Um, as to UNHCR's durable solutions, so UNHCR has developed three durable solutions, which it sees as the, the, uh, the ultimate solution for refugeehood. Um, they are local integration in the asylum state, voluntary repatriation, which for many, many years was considered the preferred durable solution, and finally resettlement, which is the transfer of a refugee from a first country of asylum to a state that has agreed to provide permanent protection. And just by way of background, uh, UNHCR's own statistics say that in the decade 20, 2010 to 2019, 322,000 refugees were naturalized. That is the ultimate form of local integration. 3.9 million refugees repatriated either voluntarily or with force, and 1.1 million were resettled um, in that decade. So if we think about a situation where there are approximately 21 million refugees, not counting the UNRWA uh, mandate, um, they're particularly low numbers for these three solutions. Um, the answer as to why they don't work, I'm not sure if I can provide one, but perhaps a couple of reflections. Firstly, of course, most refugees, I think in the world today, find themselves in countries that, as Jane Marie mentioned, either have not signed on to the convention framework or indeed have signed on, but do not provide a sort of clear uh, legal pathway to local integration. So a sort of legal limbo. Um, equally, we've seen in recent decades that conflicts have simply dragged on and on and on in states of origin which means, of course, and understandably, that refugees are unwilling to repatriate. So if you think about Afghans today, or indeed Syrians today, um, they, we're talking about conflicts, equally Somalis, that have been in existence for literally decades. 
And of course, while resettlement has only ever been a rather small and indeed symbolic contribution to the refugee regime, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the numbers resettled in 2020 were the lowest for literally decades, um, I think around 18,000 in total for, for one year. So the key question, and I'll finish up, but the key question, of course, for UNHCR is, well, can these three solutions be enlivened, revitalised, revisited, revamped, or indeed, is there a need for a sort of set of alternative solutions that may not be um, uh, durable in the sense of the, the primary three solutions, but, but nonetheless serve to provide, as Jane Marie mentioned, effective protection for refugees. Jane, you want, Jane Marie, you want to add something to that? Perhaps with another short question on top, because all these problematic that you're describing right now and that we are facing also today is that this burden sharing on the international level and uh, these obligations to look for durable solutions is ignored. So just for you, if you want to add something about it, that would be so nice. Yeah, um, I think uh, the question of durable solution is, is something that needs to be uh, looked at again. Uh, clearly, um, the, 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 the repatri repatriation is, is, is really uh, becoming, uh, uh, although it's the most preferred, but it's becoming uh, uh, the, uh, one of the difficult solutions to achieve. Um, the scale is more um, lying on the on, on local integration, although again uh, is one that needs political will uh, and re really relies on the host government. Uh, so, uh, and again, it comes with the question of burden sharing, as as you have mentioned. We have uh, we have a, a quite. A, quite uh, um, a unique unique example, sorry, unique example here in Tanzania where uh, about 170,000 um, Burundian refugees who had been in the country for like four decades were naturalized. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, almost a decade later, most of them are still uh, in limbo uh, just because of the question of burden sharing. So uh, I think it is really important um, to, to find something in, in between uh, uh, in, in terms of, of, of uh, looking at durable solutions, not necessarily uh, being um, uh, uh, pushed into uh, uh, looking at these three options. I think if there's a way of uh, thinking of something that is in between uh, uh, either local integration and repatriation. And it has worked in other places. I think in North, North Africa, there have been some kind of arrangements that would, uh, 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 some refugees would get um, uh, work permits, uh, would continue to be regarded as refugees, but would have more access to the labor market and opportunities to rebuild their lives ju um, just as refugees. And it has also been done in other places. So this, that's something, that should probably be promoted as well. Uh, that would make states, host states, not feeling that they are under the obligation to take refugees permanently, but also um, uh, ensuring that refugees are in a, in a more stable uh, 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 condition than um, uh, before. I don't know if uh, that answers the question. It does. It does. Thank you very much uh, to both our panelists for this. And uh, we have already received some questions in the chat in the Q&A section. Uh, so I would like to, to address to you the first one that we have received. It is a question for Jane Marie, but of course for the other um, speaker as well. Um, the question reads as follows. You mentioned a human rights-based approach. Can you expand what you mean from a practitioner's perspective on the ground? What does this mean? And what does this look like for the refugees and affected populations? Thank you. 
Thanks, Sissy. So, by human rights approach, um, um, what I mean is looking at, at, at refugees as people with rights and basically going back uh, to looking at uh, um, the whole act of providing asylum and providing just something that is done. Um, something that is done out of uh, uh, a goodwill of a state. Uh, there are situations where, um, uh, there are situations where uh, sometimes the legal, um, the, legal, uh, uh, the legal regime might not um, support refugees. Uh, uh, and at that particular time, you, you may need to look beyond uh, the strict legal provisions. But coming back uh, from experience, you're seeing that, um, uh, refugees are sometimes looked at as 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 people who are um, just receiving assistance, uh, people who uh, cannot claim anything, people who are just waiting for favors. But if you go back and look at it from the legal point of view and human rights point of view, that even if it is not provided uh, squarely in the refugee. Um, uh, in the Refugee Convention or Refugee Act, in the case of uh, domestic law, but as a human being, uh, this uh, this refugee has, has is a right holder. So when you start looking at it from that angle, that's when you would consider um, uh, you would you would consider um, protecting a labor market without infringing the rights. Um, of refugee to rebuild their lives through work, for example, or business. Um, uh, you would consider um, looking for um, uh, trying to enhance security without uh, unduly restricting refugee uh, uh, right to freedom of movement. Because when we don't look at these issues, a right to work, right to engage in gainful um, uh, employment, right to livelihood, uh, right to freedom of movement. When we don't look at this as rights that refugees have, that's when we feel like whenever we need to um, to protect something, whenever we need to protect host community, then we need to just um, uh, uh, infringe. Uh, now at that particular time, you are not looking at them as the rights, but from our point of view, uh, uh, you are infringing their rights. So that's what I meant by uh, looking at uh, refugee uh, protection, not just as a humanitarian developmental issue only, but also a human rights issue. Thank you. This is this is so important because uh, very much in the media or in the public discussions, uh, refugees are just numbers and that the individual the destiny and fate of the persons is absolutely ignored. Thank you for highlighting that. Uh, Nick, do you want to add something? Yeah, thank you. I'd like to come in. That was a wonderful response, Jane Marie. I entirely agree. Um, maybe I could just say something also from a legal practitioner's point of view, and that is to say that historically speaking, uh, refugee rights were seen as somewhat separate from human rights, and that is because the convention, of course, is about a particular group of people in a particular situation. Whereas human rights, of course, protect us all and provide a universal set of principles. But um, what we saw in the 90s in particular was a, a real coupling of sort of refugee standards and human rights standards and, and, the, and the integration of uh, the rights of refugees into broader human rights law. And that's been incredibly important for many reasons. But one legal reason is that the Refugee Convention is somehow an orphan. It was created in 1951. It has no authoritative uh, interpretive body that can sort of, you know, dynamically update it. And what that means is that as human rights and refugee advocates and lawyers, we've had to latch on to human rights instruments and fora to uh, try and enforce refugees' rights, which has been incredibly important work around non confinement of course, but also the rights of refugees to family and family reunification, um, and indeed the potential and we've seen much practice of the enforcement of these rights in human rights bodies, the European Court of Human Rights, the EU Court of Justice, uh, the UN treaty bodies are indeed full of asylum-related claims 
Um, so there's a very close connection today between human rights law and refugee rights. Thank you so much. So perhaps before we go to the next question of the audience, I would like to ask you, Nick, if you could tell us a little bit more about this idea of having a refugee rights committee. So um, you mentioned that. So is it a plan by NGOs or are there concrete steps planned? So what is the discussion on that? that because I think that's very exciting. So the discussion is, at least as far as I'm aware, fairly new. Um, and of course, it's important to say that UNHCR does have some authoritative role in interpreting um, the convention. Uh, it is in some form the guardian of the convention. And of course, it does provide you know, comments, comments and legislation. It provides guidelines to governments, et cetera, et cetera. But at a recent conference uh, just held in June of this year, both James Hathaway and B.S. Chimney, really leading the scholars in the field of international refugee law, supported this idea of a refugee rights committee. Um, the idea has not, as far as I'm aware, been developed beyond uh, scholarly thinking. Um, but of course, there are many models out there in the Geneva-based UN treaty bodies, um, the Human Rights Committee, the Committee Against Torture, the Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, for example, that one could model um, such a committee on. So um, I'm not sure whether there's political appetite or indeed, yeah, political support for such an idea, but, but it may gather some momentum. And maybe what I would say just now is to say that while the existence of the other treaty bodies are, of course, very important in the human rights um, world, they are by no means perfect in their operation. So I don't think we should simply duplicate a, an existing human rights committee for refugee rights because there are significant issues with these bodies that also need to be addressed. Thank you very much, Nick, for this uh, answer. I would like to, to follow up relatively on this, on this discussion um, and mainly on uh, Jane Marie's comments earlier. Um, I mean, it was, it was uh, very encouraging to hear that um, on the ground, um, at least in Tanzania, um, the human rights of refugees are respected, although um, the implementation of human rights law is not in the mind of those who actually implement these provisions. Um, I was thinking, though, at the same time that we have other states, for example, currently we have uh, Greece. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if you have heard, but recently there were many discussions about um, several uh, refugee law violations there. There always are, but uh, these days it, it has come trending again because um, not only do we have uh, refugees, they are disappearing all the time. Uh, there was a trend on Twitter, where are the children? Because many thousands of children started, went missing from uh, the island of Lesbos and um, generally uh, the situation is not well. And then we have Poland uh, currently at the same time, who does not take refugees in, although they are asylum seekers, although they are at the borders. So uh, in these situations, we have numerous um, uh, judgments by the European Court of Human Rights for both states on both of these issues. And still we see that these judgments of the European Court of Human Rights are, th th these precise judgments have been implemented, but we see that in practice violations uh, are just recycled. Uh, we see them coming back again. So. On the one hand, I, uh, I, I am of the opinion that it is very important. I mean, it is also what I do. I am trying to help from uh, a legal perspective. But then I am thinking, is it indeed um, a matter which uh, cannot be dealt with um, by ju through judgments, via judgments or uh, from a legal point of view? Uh, so I would like your observations uh, perhaps on that. Do you think that the courts have done what they can do? Uh, uh, that's, that's a million dollar uh, question. Uh, and and um, uh, at least in Europe, you, uh, as you have said, some of these, uh, um, some of these judgments have been uh, 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 implemented. Um, it's always a challenge, and I think this is uh, partly why um, 
there's low interest in, in, in engaging court um, uh, in these situations because uh, the court could do what um, they have to do, of course, interpret what the law is and determine whether there's a violation and no, or not or not, and then give judgments. And then uh, when it comes to the execution uh, or, or observing the judgment, that's when uh, uh, the real problem comes. Um, um, I can give you an example of one ca case we had. Uh, it's not um, it's not on refugees. It's on statelessness, uh, statelessness, uh, right to a nationality case. Uh, it was before the African Court of uh, uh, Human and People's Rights, and uh, we won. We had an order for for the person who had been uh, um, uh, 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 expelled from Tanzania. Uh, to, to return and uh, due process to be followed uh, regard, uh, in determining his, his uh, um, nationality. But to date, nothing has been done. And um, uh, when we follow up, uh, we're clearly told that uh, nothing is going to be done in that particular case. So that's when you, 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 you go back and ask yourself whether courts uh, uh, in these kinds of cases are the, the uh, are helpful. It's it's really a difficult question, um, and it goes back to um, to uh, what I said earlier. We need we need to reach a point where uh, 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 providing protection to refugees is looked at as an obligation. How can we do that? I, I really don't know. It's, 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 it's a question that I, I, I don't have an answer to. But um, I think looking at the whole refugee um, uh, concern uh, 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 from a holistic manner, applying comprehensive uh, approaches, uh, discussing um, root causes, uh, again, going back to um, Approaching, uh, approaching it as a human rights issue, but again and again, um, burden sharing or responsibility sharing, because you would always find um, issues uh, in areas, in countries where um, either they have hosted refugees for a long time, or they have hosted many refugees for a prolonged time. So uh, if there was a way of, um, uh, helping these, of course, there's resettlement as we know, but again, it's, it's, it doesn't take much of, uh, of refugees. So if there's a way that we could enhance this and um, show, um, show countries that are geographically, <laughs> geographically challenged in this context that they end up with many refugees, uh, showing them that they don't have to shoulder that responsibility alone. Uh, because even even resettlement in itself, there are so many questions asked on the ground. Why why all these security checks? While picking um, certain groups of people, uh, and so many uh, questions that are being asked. So if there was a way of really um, defining responsibility sharing, redefining responsibility sharing, and finding a way of um, uh, giving, uh, uh, making it an obligation to even states that uh, that do not border uh, uh, states in conflicts, for example, to 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 have a responsibility to take up a number. Uh, uh, of course, they they do it through resettlement. But if it could be uh, uh, done, um, uh, like if it could be improved, so um, it's, we need to have uh, we need to approach the issue from all angles. Judges alone cannot do it. Uh, um, human rights approach, yes. The law alone cannot help. Uh, financial um, financial uh, uh, contribution uh, helps to a certain level. So like bringing in all these um, different options that are available to ensure that the, 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 the host states uh, that feel that they, ha they are shouldering, shouldering the heavy burden or they, they are taking up the heavy responsibility of hosting refugees doesn't feel that way. Thank you so much, Jane Marie. So we have another question here from the audience for both 
follow up to next update on the possibility of establishing a refugee rights committee. How would that look like? Uh, this <laughs> inference to state sovereignty, sovereignty, considering that refugee regime is rather, rather transnational. Thank you. So perhaps um, there's much there's more uh, much discussion on this issue because I also think, um, in addition to what Jane Marie said, the judges are not the only solution for sure, but they can be an important solution when um, the protection gaps amount to crimes against humanity. Yeah. So and this is what we are experiencing. That um, what people what what governments. Uh, missed to do because of their international obligations and the situation in which they leave refugees that can amount to crimes against humanity. So then the ice there that there, it would be good to have some international body where we can bring such cases. And perhaps this rights committee could be an institution, even if it's based on NGOs. But uh, so Nick, perhaps some more details on that. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. I mean, as I said, I think it's a, an idea in development, but if I could just sketch out some of the very key elements, I think uh, to gain the, um, the most legitimacy, legitimacy possible, one would probably have to create an optional protocol uh, that would create this Refugee Rights Committee and of course, go through a period of asking states to sign on to the optional protocol. Um, so the, the way of getting around sovereignty is by asking states to agree and creating a body that is in the interests of both, of course, asylum seekers and refugees, but also states. And the argument for states here, of course, is that such a body could provide clarity on the nature and scope of obligations contained in the Refugee Convention. Um, now, of course, UNHCR already does some of this work, but because UNHCR has both a legal guidance role and a really key operational role, UNHCR faces this dilemma, in my view, of having to exercise very significant diplomatic resources to decide whether to call a violation a violation, for example, in exchange for access to a particular country or to a particular government. So that's the argument for sort of taking at least some of the interpretation of the convention out of UNHCR's hands and into an independent body. Um, so I would think of this as a long-term project and indeed requiring the uh, express agreement of states uh, to sign on to such an optional protocol. And of course, while it's tempting to think about individual complaints and, and you know, bringing uh, individual cases, I think there's also really significant value in um, what the UN treaty bodies have, the general comment system. So that is to say, rather than just an, one individual complaint, a group of experts sitting down and thinking about, well, what is Claire for more in 2021? What does responsibility sharing look like in the 21st century to try and clarify some of the obligations of states in the international refugee regime? Nice, Jean-Marie, you also want to add something? Yeah, mine is, uh, uh, I really support that idea. And uh, although I said uh, uh, sometimes uh, states would not, uh, of course, there's a challenge whether states would want to sign into that uh, uh, optional protocol. But for some reason, states do that. And later, they change their minds. But what I wanted to say uh, is that uh, that is important. It's, uh, if it's possible to establish it, it um, I would support it. Um, not because it will bring immediate changes, but um, because um, uh, again, as I said before, all these uh, efforts from different angles, at the end of the day, would, um, would uh, uh, um, they, they are some kind, I would say they are, um, uh, uh, they are pushing the agenda forward. So if you have a court judgment, for example, and you, if you have this committee saying there was a violation, and if you have NGOs making noise through uh, other channels and so on and so forth, I, 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 this is what we need. And it will reach a point where um, uh, a state that is 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 um, is receiving all that would uh, probably decide to sit back and reconsider its approach towards refugees. So I am I am supportive of that idea as well. Thank you. 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 Th
uh, if I could, if I can add something, one thing that I um, I've just remembered when uh, when Nikki was talking is the idea that that um, if I remember correctly was uh, I read it in one, in one of the articles of uh, Alexander Beth and James Milner, if my memory is correct, and uh, this goes to um, burden sharing, and they were proposing uh, something um, similar to the G20. Uh, where like the, the the richest country would meet and discuss and make decisions and all that. So they were suggesting something uh, they called R20. And uh, for them, they say this should bring together uh, the top um, refugee funding countries, but also the top um, refugee hosting countries on the table. And uh, then uh, this should be uh, a, a body that kind of uh, 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 makes that gives the direction in terms of refugee protection and all that. So I, I remembered it and I said I should share it as we're talking about what should be done in this situation. Thank you so much. So the last questions we have from the audience is on the UN Roi Palestine. So thank you for highlighting that UNRWA has a unique mandate. UNRWA was established in 49 as a temporary UN organization and remains temporary with its mandate renewed every three years by all UN member states. UNRWA is only mandated to protect and provide humanitarian services to eligible registered Palestine refugees in its five fields of operation. Today, UNRWA serves 5.7 million refugees in Jordan, Syria, West Bank, Gaza, and Lebanon. All other Palestine refugees residing in other countries are served by UNHCR. Um, yeah, do you want to comment on that? Nick? Uh, I didn't catch a question in there. I mean, it sounds no, it's not the question. It's like it's it's just a comment to you that you highlighted that UNRWA has a special position in all that. Yeah, I mean, I guess from a legal perspective, um, one can say that uh, at the establishment of both UNRWA and the convention framework, there was a clear decision to essentially um, distinguish between Palestinian refugees and other refugees, and that is to say that Article 1D of the Convention states that a person cannot be protected by the Refugee Convention framework if they are receiving uh, protection from another UN agency, that is uh -huh. uh, UNRWA. Mm -hmm. So it's a strange uh, sort of historical and indeed legal anomaly of the international refugee regime that has real impacts today. I mean, we see, uh -huh. of course, Palestinian refugees seeking protection in Europe, for example, who are um, not considered within the scope of the convention. Okay, for finalizing this session, I would like to please you to make a very last statement to the public on how we can strengthen Geneva, the, the Refugees Convention, because it's our only tool we can work with <laughs> to highlight the rights of refugees. So what shall be done to strengthen this important uh, treaty? Jane-Marie, you want to start, perhaps? Uh, um, I think um, we, we're already trying to do that uh, through, um, uh, through what we're doing with things like uh, the, the Global Compact uh, on Refugees, uh, because uh, I think, in my opinion, and many, probably many people would think the same, uh, it, it might not be a good idea to talk about um, uh, coming up with a new convention because, be, yeah, thanks. Uh, so um, I was saying that uh, it might not be a good idea uh, talking about um, uh, opening up the convention again, maybe for discussions or because uh, have, looking at all the challenges we're facing uh, um, uh, in, its, its, uh, in, in, in states observing it in its current condition, you might just guess what would happen if we talk about uh, 
uh, um, trying to amend it, if I can use that term. So I'm, um, in my opinion, we're already trying to do that uh, by um, coming up with, um, with all these other, uh, not binding uh, uh, frameworks, but they're kind of trying to address uh, the shortcomings of the, of the, of the convention. Uh, so the Global Compact on Refugees, I just mentioned it, is, is one of the examples. But um, uh, 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 protocols, specific protocols uh, that could address specific issues. Um, uh, but I think uh, the most important thing is just to find a way um, of making uh, of making uh, the responsibility of, of hosting refugees something that is done uh, graciously by states. So that's that's what I can say. So Nick, you're working in a country that uh, decided to clearly violate the Refugees Convention. <laughs> so what do you say about that? Yeah, thanks, Bianca. I mean, for background, I guess, um... I could very briefly explain that Denmark is seeking to um, externalize its asylum responsibilities by, by sending asylum seekers to a third state outside the EU, where they will go through an asylum procedure and indeed receive international protection. Um, so I'm not particularly optimistic about the future of, of, of refugee protection. But if I could say something about uh, sort of, uh, the future frontiers of advocacy and research, I think it's important to remember that while the 51 Convention is, of course, imperfect and has the gaps that we've discussed, it none, nonetheless remains the, the fundament of the entire protection system. So even when in Europe we have the Qualification Directive, we have the African Convention, we have Cartagena, they all draw on the Convention as a baseline and build from that. So we should, of course, stick to the Convention as a legal commitment. And in my view, I think we should try to encourage governments to, rather than um, reject or subvert or seek to avoid the convention, encourage them to think of it as a workable framework that does indeed seek to meet the interests of states in controlling migration, in having uh, robust border arrangements, but of course, refugees on the other hand and the rights that are afforded to them. Um, so in my view, uh, the convention can be used flexibly in a way that meets both the control interests of governments and respects refugee rights. And of course, as Jane Marie's mentioned, I mean, there is a clear need to be uh, very clear eyed about what gaps exist and, and how they can be filled. And we've discussed a little bit about what may be possible. Um, I personally think that in, in my part of the world, um, these new legal pathways, pathways like humanitarian corridors, community sponsorship of refugees, tick the boxes of both allowing states to feel control over borders and indeed involving civil society and ordinary people in the reception, protection and integration of refugees, which may in the long term serve to turn the political tide that we're currently seeing. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. So yeah, so in the, the coming sessions, uh, we are going to discuss more in depth various aspects that we started discussing here. So dear participants, please follow us during the series of lectures. I would like to thank everybody of you, Jay Marie, Nick, and also Sissy for doing this session. And um, I hope we stay in touch. And I wish everybody a very nice evening. Nick and Jay Marie, Sissy, if you could stay just for another five minutes, it would be great. For the participants, a wonderful evening. So you can stop the recording.